From the heartland of America and the gateway to the West, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be across the nation, around the world. I'm George Norrie. This is Coast to Coast AM. Later tonight, those open lines. Remember our new phone policy on open lines. You may call the guest and you may also call open lines. Two calls a night if you're lucky enough to get in. Here's what's happening. Las Vegas Metro Police have released details of Tupac Shakur's murder, including a mugshot of the now-accused killer, Dwayne Kife D. Davis, has been charged with the murder of the rapper, according to the investigators. The charge will carry a gang enhancement due to his involvement in the Crips Street Gang. The prosecution claims that tensions between the Compton Bloods and the Crips led to the deadly incident. As a result of Davis himself talking to the media about the killing and writing a book about it, officers revealed they became re-energized about the case. 1996 is when the shooting occurred. Tupac was 25 years old. California Senator Dianne Feinstein has died. She was 90 years old, the oldest person in the Senate. The United Auto Workers Union will expand strikes against General Motors and Ford Motor Company, the two U.S. assembly plants at noon Eastern time, according to the UAW president, Sean Fain, affecting 7,000 more workers. Already 15,000 are on strike. There's a total of about 150,000 UAW workers already. What's been going on in the skies this week? Let's check in with Kevin Randall. Kevin, what do you got for us? Good evening, George. Hi there. How you doing? All righty, my friend. I always looking forward to your reports. Well, thank you. Uh, Jan Aldridge, who has been researching UFO sightings and documents for many years, mentioned a few points about the Freedom of Information Act. He said that Ryan Cusack had been at the National Archives and reported that there are 1,434 boxes of UFO-related material that are in no real chronological order. Kuzak said that that might be why the archives had stopped answering Aldridge's uh, FOIA request, though I suspect the failure is more pervasive than just Aldridge's request based on my own experiences. Kuzak had searched through some of those boxes just to see if there were any intelligence reports from ATEC, which is mostly Project Blue Book files, and if they had anything in, of significance in them. Most of the documents are routine, but there is material that had not been found in other searches and other archives and document repositories. He discovered that Ed Ruppelt, who was the chief of uh, Project Blue Book in the 1950s, had briefed the CIA on a plan to release the Utah UFO film. And that was a short color film that uh, Navy Warrant Officer Delbert C. Newhouse had made of bright objects in the sky over Utah in July of 1952. Though the official explanation was birds, interviews with Newhouse, including one by me, suggested that he and his wife had seen the UFOs at close range and said that they were disc-shaped and were not birds, which is why he stopped the car and took uh, the camera out of the trunk so that he could film them in the first place. The point here is that it seems that the transparency alluded to by some government officials is being stymied by a lower level of bureaucracy who are apparently ignoring the requests, sometimes They respond with a request for preliminary payment for the search, and that can reach to hundreds if not thousands of dollars. And we know that more than one official has suggested the search for UFO material and congressional investigations might be bad for the DOD. That doesn't mean there aren't good UFO sightings out there. I have been looking for sightings in which there are photographs or video. Many of the videos are from security cameras, such as the one from Lewiston, Idaho, on August 31st of this year. The witness did not see the object, but did see it on the video display and said the sighting lasted for about two minutes. The object was oval-shaped and seemed to be leaving some sort of short trail behind it. The witness said that when you zoom in on the object, you can see it pulsate. I don't know what it is, but thought it was interesting, and you can see the video at the National UFO Reporting Center website for August of this year. Any thoughts about that uh, would be appreciated. In another way, somewhat similar case, from also from August of 31st of this year, in Buckeye, Arizona, the witness said that while attempting to learn who or what was stealing his cat's food outside, saw an object cross the sky at the top of the video he had made. 
It moves rapidly in a straight line, and the witness did not see the object. There's a suggestion that this might be an insect, but I've watched that video many times. I noticed a very faint object lift from the left toward the gate that seemed to blink and suspect that is an insect. The object moving at the top of the screen is much brighter, moving in a straight line, and doesn't look like the videos I have seen of insects flying around my own security cameras. It would help to know about the lighting sources around that house. Once again, the video can be seen at the National UFO Reporting Center website. Just scroll down to Buckeye, Arizona to see it. And I'd be interested in what others think about the video. And if nothing else, it is interesting. And that's it for tonight, George. All right, my friend, we'll talk to you next week. Kevin's latest book, Understanding Roswell. A former funeral home in Massachusetts has hit the market for sale, but buyers are being warned that the property is probably haunted. The Turgeon Funeral Home, built in 1850, is located in downtown Millbury. The home was built for a single family, but it has been run as a funeral home since 1948. The dwelling has been listed for $769,000. Would you buy it? I'm not sure I would. Have you ever been in the dark or a shadowy room and thought that you saw a human-like shape lurking in the darkness? If so, you may have been visited by a shadow people. Shadow people are believed to be the visual form of spirits or other entities trying to make their presence known in the human world. They appear as shadows in this world that we're in. Heidi Hollis coined the phrase shadow people. Heidi, they're real things, aren't they? Hey there, George. Hi, George. Yes, they are indeed. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think they were once people, but they were not. Shadow people have never been people and they also don't wear clothes. They don't look like you or I. And uh, if they have round eyes, if they're short, those are usually aliens. Uh, and a lot of people are having a hard time distinguishing. Also, the hooded ones are not shadow people. Those are aliens. So, yeah, uh, there's a lot of confusion out there, but we're doing our best to distinguish between them and Hat Man and uh, so many other things. Heidi, what do they want? Oh, gosh, when it comes to the shadow people, they want everything. They want your soul. They want your essence. They want your fear. They want to cause. They want to create, and they are attracted to those things. Do they hurt people? Oh, they hurt. They maim. They kill, unfortunately, and uh, possess. Absolutely. And Hat Man's a thousand times worse because he directs them on what they're doing. Is everybody a potential victim? It's not just a a possibility, it's a threat. And uh, at the levels that I was told they would get and warned how they would get this bad. And uh, there's more to the story, and I'll be definitely, hopefully, I'm getting closer and closer to sharing more of what it all entails. Because, you know, it didn't come from me, this information. It came from other alien beings that had a message uh, and a warning, and they haven't been wrong yet. Heidi's website is her name, HeidiHollis.com. Thanks, Heidi. Talk to you soon enough. In a moment, Archbishop Ron File and right back with us as we talk about demons and exorcists. His latest book is called Diabolical Nightmares of Real Cases and Demonic Possession Told by the Exorcist. He's next on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you, Archbishop Ronald File Enright is a chief exorcist with extensive experience spanning at least 46 years. And throughout his ministry, he has conducted thousands of exorcism rituals, including case assessments for demonic infestation and possession. He has been privileged to serve as the founder of the Order of Exorcists, which is an international organization with members in 24 countries. Members include a diverse group of professionals, including priests, bishops, lead assessment team investigators, counseling psychiatrists as well. His latest book, as I mentioned, is called Diabolical Nightmares of Real Cases and Demonic Possession Told by the Exorcist. Horrifying realities do exist in dark places. That's scary stuff, Archbishop Ron. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, George. How are you? I'm doing fine. How about yourself? I've been pretty busy lately, considering I, I kind of call myself retired, but that's not really the case. Uh, people cannot, for some reason, cannot lose my phone number. People are constantly contacting me, and I'm constantly busy. So even though I'm in a somewhat uh, semi-retired uh, uh, position, I am still so busy, you wouldn't believe it. 
I'm going to ask you to get closer to your microphone because you sound like you're in a tin can. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. I, I can assure you I'm not in a tin can, <laughs> but I'm right here. Can you hear me any better? A little better. A little better. So we'll keep our fingers crossed and hope the demons aren't trying to keep you away from us. This is a very, very good possibility. You know, it does happen, especially when we're dealing with uh, electronics and, and all this modern technology, you know. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. How did you become interested in exorcisms? You know, it all happened. It was a uh, supernatural event that occurred when I was 11 years old. And I, uh, I was in, in the bathroom taking a shower, and this super bright light just illuminated the entire bathroom. It came through the bathroom window, and it was so bright, I had to shut my eyes. As I did, I saw myself in the future. And keep in mind, I'm only 11 years old. I saw myself in the future wearing a Roman collar and serving the church in some capacity. And then it... At, at that split second, I opened my eyes, and I could just see the vapors just leave the bathroom, and it just simply dissipated. And ever since then, I've been uh, very much aware of, of the supernatural thing that happens in the world. And it's like a new perspective. I, I just, I, I kind of like uh, uh, got a sense of the reality of what's going on. Did you did you come into this? Kicking and screaming, or was it really truly voluntary on your part? I, I consider it a divine calling. I believe that God had uh, communicated with me, and, and though 11 years old, I, I, I was apparently very open to whatever God had to say. I was right there and ready to listen and, and obey. And, and since that time, uh, throughout my life, I've started experiencing all types of really interesting things. That is, things that would be classified as unbelievable and pretty scary. Do you do you see demons outside the physical body or not? I do. I actually do. I, in fact, most of my ministry has been spent in the Skid Row areas of downtown Los Angeles. And most of the time, the either the owner or the management of these Skid Row hotels would contact and they would ask if uh, if I could do some form of assessment and see what's going on. And so as a result, of, and this started like in the very early 1980s. And so we started um, uh, making these calls and making assessments, and uh, and it just took off from there. You have to understand that most people that live in these Skid Row hotels, uh, they like fall under you know the, the category of of being desperate, perhaps maybe uh, they're down on their luck. They might have substance abuse problems, uh, maybe even um, uh, issues with the uh, you know law enforcement, and and so crime is always there. And then they're very suicidal. You have overdoses. You have all kinds of things, which means that there's a spiritual residual that's left in that structure. So when that happens, supernatural things take place. That is, you know. Walls start banging. Uh, people uh, can can swear that they hear whispering, and, and these are at just like one or two floors. There's one hotel in uh, in Skid Row in, in downtown Los Angeles. It has uh, 14 stories, and this type of activity occurs. It has been occurred uh, occurring every uh, ever since 1920s. So I mean, this is an old hotel. And you have all these spiritual uh, residuals from people who have uh, who have committed suicide, uh, jumped off the 14th floor, and so on. And it's so interesting because throughout the entire uh, uh, hotel, it's only the 14th floor that has all these disturbances. Hmm. What does a demon look like, Archbishop? My uh, and it's so funny because I when I see them, they. Don't change. They, they have the same image. What I see is a gray, long face, and they're always wearing what appears to be a hood. And as a result, I've, I've seen them. <laughs> I tell people this, it makes me crazy. Um, <laughs> but, um, and, and I, I have two psychiatrists who are in our organization. They confirm that I'm not crazy. <laughs> but these things actually exist. Um, so as a result, um, uh, I have seen them. I've seen them in, especially uh, in 
hotels where they're in a, a, a bona fide demonic infestation where everything, the, the whole structure is being pounded by these uh, multiple demonic entities. And the people in these hotels, they are living uh, on, on the lowest level of life that you could even imagine. So a lot of them uh, are just suffering socially, and they have other social, uh, uh, you know, uh, problems. But as a result, you know, they're they're living there. It's the only place. It's the next step of being homeless. You know, they're in that hotel, and that's that's their structure. And as a result, they have to experience all the residuals that have taken place in the past. And that would go for everything from suicides to uh, demonic possession uh, to uh, uh, things of this nature. It's very, very. Uh, it's very alarming to say the least. How many people who are possessed are considered mentally ill and they're really possessed? It's possible. It's very possible that they could have both going on. They could have a psychosis and still be possessed by a demonic entity. Um, and the reason what we do when we do our assessment, uh, we not only uh, record everything and, and we have a questionnaire that we uh, that, that we direct to the victim and family members. But we also uh, we also ask for a psychological report, uh, which they would furnish. And then once they furnish the psychological report from their doctors, we will uh, relate it to our psychiatrist, and they will review the actual reports. And if it's something that that, that needs our attention, or, or or there's nothing at all, they they will let us know. If it's a normal uh, type of scenario, or if there's something that's really uh, uh, really telling in regards to uh, some form of psychosis that they would uh, alert us. But understand, there are certain things that um, that mental illness uh, will not um, uh, will not show. Uh, for example, um, mental illness can mimic possession, and possession can mimic mental illness. So you see, there's a very fine line there. But when you see the victim levitate, when you see the victim uh, in an environment where things are flying around. And, uh, and and everything is defying the laws of gravity, then you have to understand that this is not a psychosis. Right. You know, we are dealing with something supernatural, and as a result, you know, we have, we have to be on our toes and document everything and make sure we have the, uh, the proper uh, support system in place. We normally have some medical uh, practitioner who's with our assessment team, and that's either a practical nurse or a LVN, or, uh, or, or something like this, where we have someone who is medically trained. In the event, as we're doing the evaluation, and by the way, I'm not involved in the evaluations. I, I oversee the evaluations by, by examining them and making a final decision based on our psych, uh, psychiatrist uh, uh, recommendations. Um, so I don't make a decision until we have all the paperwork in. So understand, I'm not even on site when the first contact interview is made. Uh, we rely on our laity, and sometimes we do have a clergy member who is uh, who is, wants to join in on the uh, on the assessment team. But what they do basically is they uh, not only interview the victim, but they also get the input from the family members and even the neighbors in regards to what's happening. And then at that point, there's always someone. And these days, everyone has an iPhone, so everyone has a recorder. So everyone that's on the team, they're they're literally not only um, focusing on on the victim, but they're also looking for outward manifestations that are around the victim, or within the house, or within whatever structure it is. And if there is some type of physical movement where we can actually see something going on, then that's considered uh, proof that we have to further investigate. Now we do that by investigating not only the individual, but we also investigate the property. We investigate the house. We see if there's any history, uh, anything that may have uh, occurred. It's interesting, though, uh, there have been quite a few uh, residents where where we have found that there were human sacrifices made. And we're talking about, you know, 100 years ago or so. Uh, and as a result, the, the residual is still in the structure, which means that you have, you know, an ideal uh, uh, situation for uh, a, a, a demonic infestation. 
Archbishop, stay with us. We're going to take a short break. We'll come back and talk more about your work as an exorcist. The book is called Diabolical Nightmares of Real Cases and Demonic Possession Told by the Exorcist. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Nori with Archbishop Ron File and Wright. Ron, what is the procedure to determine whether someone needs to be exercised or not? Do you have a checklist of questions? What do you go through? Yes, we have questions, actually. And we have three things to check. The mental changes, the physical changes in the individual, as well as the physical manifestations. Uh, we ask them a series of questions, and uh, and once we have the answers, uh, we, uh, we, we simply uh, compile all the other information, the evidence. Evidence could be uh, maybe some type of video or photographs of some type of uh, activity taking place. Uh, of course, a video uh, a presentation is more effective when we could actually see uh, a, a, a manifestation take place where things are flying off the shelves or, or things in this nature, or we're recording uh, the sounds that are coming from the walls when there's nothing on the other side of the wall, but it's the outside of the wall, and you can hear the sounds coming in. Um, so, you know, we analyze all of this information. And then, of course, we have the psychological reports that are submitted uh, by, uh, by the family's uh, psychiatrist or psychologist. And then we pass those on to our uh, medical uh, staff, and uh, we get their feedback. Once I have their feedback, then I can make a proper assessment uh, in regards to the final decision as to whether or not we should perform an actual exorcism. Now, it depends where the jurisdictional uh, bishop is located. Understand, I have bishops in 24 countries around the world. I have uh, and also in 19 states, U.S. states. So each of these uh, jurisdictions, there's a bishop. And the bishop is in charge of that jurisdiction. He has his own investigation team. And in that investigation team, they would do the first contact. They would uh, uh, collect all the evidence or the lack of evidence in regards to what the case is all about. We have to verify that it's a truly a, a demonic issue and not just simply someone's imagination or some form of psychosis. We have to, there's a very fine line there. If it's, it's surely, if it's, if, if there's some type of, uh, of um, psychological uh, issue involved and there's no demonic and we decide to actually uh, approve an exorcism, then that could drive the victim further into their psychosis and they could have a mental breakdown, which could lead to suicide. And yes, there have been a lot of people that have actually died during the, uh, the actual ritual, uh, but for many different reasons, mainly because of what's going on within themselves. It could be a health issue, it could be a psychological issue, or it could be a real demonic issue that's going on within their, within their environment. If that happens, then we have to uh, make sure that we make a proper call in regards to whether or not it's genuine. Has anybody tried to trick you as a joke? Yes. Many, uh, unfortunately, many times. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to give this number out, okay? And it's very accurate. Okay, I, I've been doing this for a very long time, over four decades. And I can tell you that we've had thousands of documented cases, thousands. And I can tell you out of those thousands and thousands, let's just say, uh, we'll, we'll round it up to about, let's say every thousand cases that come in uh, requesting an evaluation and, and requesting a, an actual ritual. What we'll do is do the whole process. And after all that process is done, then we'll make a decision that we can actually verify if any of the, uh, let's say, the, the thousand, okay, cases are, are genuine. Out of the thousand, we might get, are you ready for this? About five. Five genuine cases out of a thousand. Now, that means that, that wow. majority, more than half, it's a majority, it can be either explained. Uh, there's uh, some natural uh, phenomenon that's happening. And if that be the case, then obviously we, we can't uh, go through with an actual ritual. The ritual doesn't come until we, after we do the entire, uh, the entire assessment process, the investigations, uh, the collection of evidence, and the examination of the psychological profiles. So, I mean, there's a whole big process involved, and there's many uh, different groups that have to collaborate in order for us to make uh, a decision in, in a timely fashion. Now, the timely fashion could be anywhere from, and unfortunately, this is a fact, if it's done properly, 
anywhere from three to six months before we could actually make a decision. And that sounds like a very long time. But as I said, we're very thorough. We have to make sure that we uh, take the analytical approach and make sure that we have the medical community, the psychological community, the health community on, on board with, 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 with the various things that we do. As you probably know, um, there have been cases in the past where the clergy have been held accountable because uh, the victim uh, died, okay, uh, uh, while they were doing the, the ritual. This has happened many a time. So you don't hear very much uh, about these cases, but they do exist. So uh, we have to be uh, extremely careful uh, and, and make sure that what we're doing is uh, that our assessments are accurate and, and there's enough documentation and evidence that we can go forward and actually do a ritual. What do they die of? Natural causes? What happens to them? Uh, heart attacks. Uh, sometimes uh, there was one person that uh, died of suffocation. <laughs> uh, suffocation? Suffocation, oh. you know, the lack of oxygen and just uh, their heart stopped. Um, heart attacks, of course. Uh, there's so many things. Before I forget, George, um, I have to tell you, I, I never have a problem with the audio uh, on, my, on my devices. Um, I do podcasts. Uh, I'm on a podcast show. Uh, one of my colleagues that you that I know you know very well is going to be on, and you're going to be interviewing him, uh, I think, within a, a month or so. Um, and he's a spiritual warrior. That's Reverend Bill Bean. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm going to be with him in Columbus at, at a live event as well. He's a, he's a colleague of mine. We did a, we did a, a seminar convention in um in Connecticut uh, just a few months ago. He's such a great guy, and I've known him for so many years, and it's the first time we actually met physically. Since then, I've been a, a guest on his podcast every Friday, so uh, I'm on his Warrior Mode program, it's called, and uh, and I'm there just, uh, you know, just to give my input. But Bill, Reverend Bill, is probably one of the most powerful spiritual warriors I know. He is. He in everything he says, and he's very effective. You know what he does? He, he drives. He drives from state to state trying to help people in his uh, ministry of deliverance. I mean, he just, uh, I mean, he sacrifices so much of his time, energy, and, and even his, his financial support, I'm sure. And he, uh, just to help individuals. He's such a wonderful man. That's why I'm so honored to be affiliated with him. That's great. Let's go back to your headsets on, by the way. Put them back on, okay? Yeah, we'll do that. Let's do that. I think we can get a little better quality out of you. I'm so, so sorry about that. And I'm, I'm going to try to explain that to you, too, by the way, because this is not a natural thing. Hold on one second. Okay, we'll let you put that on. We're talking to the Archbishop Ron File Enright, who's an exorcist. Lots more questions to ask him. We're, we're going to take your calls next hour as well on Coast to Coast. You there, Ron? Yes, I'm back. Great. Why would anybody, and I'm not degrading what you do, but why would anybody want to be an exorcist? Well, it's not a job, and it's not something that anyone would want to do. <laughs> what it is, it's a calling. When God calls you, when the Creator calls you, and you know it's a divine calling, it's something that you follow. It's your belief system that God has called or chosen you to do this type of ministry. Not everyone can do an exorcism. Not everyone could do what we do and, and actually survive it. <laughs> and to be effective, we have to have that divine calling. So it, it's, not, it's not a choice. Well, it, it is a choice for, for us uh, personally, but it, it's not like something that, that – it it's not our desire to be a nexus. It just happens to be that we were called to do this. How does the initial call come to you? What is it? Who is it? My experience was when I was 11 years old and I heard uh, and saw myself in the future. And that's when this bright light burst in the bathroom uh, while I was taking a shower. And I closed, I shut my eyes, and I saw everything. And it, I, I believe that was a, a divine uh, a vision, if you, want, if you want to call it that. And as a result, um, it, my life, my whole perspective changed at that point. And I understand I was only 11 years old. But... Uh, but everything changed from that point. But, I mean, who makes that initial call to you that 
my uncle needs an exorcism or my son is oh, possessed. Well, in, this, in, in this case, okay, we have uh, websites, we have uh, forums, okay, uh, worldwide. And when people have a problem within their family, they feel that there's some type of a, a supernatural thing occurring. Perhaps something is happening within the family unit and they can't explain it. They would uh, look someone up and we're all over the place. You know, we're, we're online and, and people can just contact us. And there's an actual form that they have to fill out. They have to give us their name, uh, you know, the phone number, the email address, their physical location, and also a detailed uh, description as to what's going on in their situation. And then at that point, we follow up uh, with our, our assessment team. They would make the first call, the first contact, and at that point, they would do the interview, they do the investigation, do the evaluation, and then they'll collect all the information we need so we can make a valid uh, decision as to whether or not we should go through with an exorcism. Are you the last person they call when they're going through this process? I would be, uh, no, actually, I'm actually the first person. <laughs> I'm the first person they would call, but then at that point, I would contact all of my members worldwide, and I'd send them a mass email, and I do that, uh, the last one I sent was today, <laughs> and so all my members would receive an email. The email will have all the details, all the, uh, all the things that they're, they're requesting in regards to uh, help and assistance, and then if they're within their jurisdiction, they would contact me and say, I'm going to work the case. And at that point, they would assign their assessment teams, which is local. Uh, for example, you know, we have, we have teams in the Philippines. We have teams in Poland uh, or even Canada. And, and, and if somebody in Canada contacts, you know, and, and hits my, my website and contacts it and requests uh, uh, our help, then I would contact uh, everyone, not just one person in Canada. I would contact everyone because... There are some people, like like I said, like even my colleague would do it, would go out of state and help an individual, okay? And, and that's why it, it's so important that you contact the right people when you have demonic issues. Archbishop, what is that one major factor that leads you to believe this person is possessed? When they start uh, gurgitating um, solid objects, like nails, glass, uh, rocks, um, and when things like that uh, occur, when they start levitating, when they start like hitting the ceiling, uh, or stuck to the wall, where they're suspended and they're just stuck on the wall. And it, you know, it's so bizarre. It sounds so bizarre. But when these things happen, you know that they're supernatural things, and they're all tied in to what's going on in the individual's life. And at that point, they're at the lowest point the lowest point in their life. I mean, they are, uh, first of all, they have no control of what's happening. And as a result, the demonic will actually use the body like a puppet. And the personality of the, of the demonic will actually manifest. And you can see not only the gurgling voice and maybe speaking in different languages or having super strength, all those things, those things can also be explained uh, psychologically. But when you see a person who's stuck to the wall, or if you see a person that's just about hitting the ceiling and, and with no support, defying all laws of gravity, but when you see things happening around that person where things are flying around uh, the house and, and in the room within the immediate space of the individual, then you know it's not a psychosis. So when we get in, uh, evidence like that and we have enough evidence uh, to support a case uh, along with the psychological profile, then we will uh, proceed from there. What does the demon want, Archbishop? What's their end game? Their end game is to destroy God's creation. Ever since Lucifer was thrust out of hell, or out of heaven, I should say, and took one third of the angels, which the fallen angels are referred to as demons now, uh, when Lucifer came down, okay, uh, he came down and he was, he was thrown out of heaven at rebellion. He was just being so rebellious. He wanted to, to, to be like God. He wanted God, he wanted God to actually be a... Uh, uh, his equal, and, and so on, and, and God would not allow that. So when Satan was thrown, or Lucifer was thrown uh, out of heaven, uh, and then now we know him as Satan and all the demons, fallen angels, the demons, uh, when that happened, they want revenge. They want to, to, to retaliate. And that is the only best way to do that is to, is to uh, destroy God. 
God's creation, which uh, which is mankind. So their end goal is to destroy us. Now, they will hurt us physically, but they will drive us to a point where we find ourselves hurting ourselves. That is, um, they'll, they'll drive us to a point where we will destroy ourselves uh, physically, mentally, uh, or both. And so that, that type of scenario is a very real thing. So so the demonic will actually uh, try to, um, to, and this is where, where demonic oppression comes in, by the way. Uh, this is like an implant. The, the, the demonic will actually implant an idea in the subconscious uh, brain. And, and that person will actually think that their bad behavior, negative behavior, is actually a normal thing because they, they have no idea that they have been uh, intruded or, or, um, or uh, gained entry by this, by this demonic uh, entity. And so as a result, their whole, their whole demeanor, their whole outlook, would be not only negative, but this is the type of thing that would go on with serial killers. Um, and, and you see that same look, the same stare that they have. It's all because of the demonic oppression that's very, very strong, which can lead to demonic possession. All right, hold on. We're going to take a short break and come back and take phone calls with you in just a moment. 